I, I don't intend to spend a whole lot of time describing how this, uh, these, uh, these interviews were done. Tom has, has, has been very good on that and, and about the priors and the money. And I was going to tease David Pryor a little bit, but he took a run out powder. He's not here tonight, I see. About putting all that leftover campaign money in a Swiss bank account and what he had left over shared with us. <laughs> I'll just let that hang there in the air, and he, if word gets back to him, he can answer it if he wants to. <laughs> what, what I want to do is read uh, seven or eight very short uh, sections of this book to give you uh, an idea of the flavor of what it is, and, and those of you who, who uh, want to buy the book, you'll, you'll get a little preview here. Let, let me start, start out with a, just a, a couple of paragraphs at, in the preface. The Arkansas Gazette was John Netherland High School's newspaper for 70 years. He became its editor and one of its principal owners in 1902 at the age of 30. He relinquished his grip on it in 1972 a few weeks after he turned 100, and they buried him in Mount Holly Cemetery. In many ways, it re is this microphone echoing somehow? Is it okay? It seems to me it's whistling back at me. But... Hell, I'm not even supposed to be using that. I don't know why I'm, <laughs> no wonder I'm confused. Thank you, Tom. I have a few words to say about technology later on in the book. <laughs> yeah. uh, in many ways, it remained his paper for several years afterward during the stewardship of his son-in-law, Hugh B. Patterson, Jr., who already had nudged it into the modern age and made it financially stable. Then came the age of the corporate chains. And Mr. Heiskell's paper went the way of many other American newspapers, good and bad. But for most of the 20th century, the paper was one of the nation's finest. Those golden years are called up in the first part of this book through the memories of people who worked there. The dismal years are recorded here too. They are not pleasant reading, but serious readers people who keep abreast of public affairs need to be reminded just how bad things can get when the messenger becomes part of the problem. I'm skipping ahead in the preface to the, to the, uh, the last paragraph. This is the story of a proud institution peopled by proud journalists, men and women who knew precisely who they were suffering no latter-day crises of identity. They knew that the Arkansas Gazette was not only the oldest newspaper west of the Mississippi River, but also the best paper for hundreds of miles in every direction. Famous right around the country and respected by newspaper people from the Atlantic to the Pacific. In Arkansas, even those who hated it were suspected of being quietly proud of it. And if any of those folks are in the audience tonight, I, I'd like to invite you to come up to the microphone and talk about it if you want to. <laughs> the Gazette story does not have a happy ending. We shall put that off as long as possible. The last gasp is a tale of stubbornness, stupidity, arrogance, and willful ignorance in the upper reaches of a, of a large national company but I must be patient. First, the golden years. And let me, let me skip over to the, uh, the very beginning of the Arkansas Gazette. Just this one more time. We'll get it right. Shouldn't be anywhere. All right. And this is the beginning of a chapter titled Mr. Woodruff's Newspaper. The Arkansas Gazette was born in a log cabin November 20th, 1819, on a bank of the Arkansas River. A local establishment donated a barrel of whiskey to celebrate the event. 
The first issue carried a complaint from a citizen that the town had too many lawyers. When the paper died 167 years later, the problem was not lawyers but corporate executives who had found themselves, to their confusion, in charge of the oldest newspaper west of the Mississippi and not knowing what to do with it. I'm going to give you two or three samples of the, uh, the interviews that we did. And some of the, uh, one of the things that will come through as you read the paper is the Gazette had at least its share, maybe more, of eccentrics. And one of the great ones was the police reporter for 50 years, Joe Wurgis. Uh, I, I was privileged, privileged to be there during Joe's last years. I, I see people, some of the others remember Joe Wurgis. Yeah, yeah, he, I can still hear his voice. Yeah. Uh, Ernie wanted me to read a, 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 a short story here that Bob Douglas uh, uh, re remembered and talking about Joe Wurgis. Some woman had committed a murder and she was sent to the penitentiary. Joe went in his car. He was going to cover her walking in through the prison gates. It was a men's penitentiary. They got there and the warden or whoever said, I can't take her, we can't take her here. Nobody told me anything about this. And the deputy sheriff who brought her said, I've done my part <laughs> and, got, and got in his car and. And, and went back to Little Rock. So Joe gave her a ride back. <laughs> and on, on Saturday night, the one night that we competed with the Democrat then, uh, the Democrat being an afternoon paper, we competed for the Sunday paper. So Joe drove her around and talked to her until past the Democrats' deadline and then put her on a train. She got on a train and never served a day. Joe knew all the crooks, all the criminals. He would go down to death row and eat the last meal with the condemned man. Join him. Well, he, he got a good meal out of it. And he'd talk about their corneas. Joe always had bad eyes, and he collected corneas for the eye bank. Would talk about their corneas. I wish I could read more about Joe. He, he, he's worth a, a whole chapter by himself, but we finally had to cut it short. But one of the other uh, great Gazette hands was Leland Duvall. And I'm sure a lot of you remember Leland. He's, he's the one we all went to when we were too lazy to go to the morgue for information. We'd just go ask Leland because he carried all of history in his head. And he, he describes here how he got into journalism. He was a World War II veteran, and Ernie and I went up and interviewed him one day for a good part of a day up on Crow Mountain. And, and he, among other things, he told us about being shot at. I can't remember how the story went, but it was just a, 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 a very narrow escape. Uh, but he finally got back home, and we had the GI Bill and he, uh, to pay the, uh, college tuition for veterans that he ended up at Arkansas Tech at Russellville uh, where he uh, was taking English, excuse me, and, he, and the, uh, his English teacher came in one day and asked him if he'd be willing to go down and help out at the, at the Russellville Courier. They were shorthanded and he did and, and here's the way he describes uh, what happened next. The Courier was a locally owned paper. His news editor was named Seton Ross, S-E-A-T-O-N, Seton Ross. Seton Ross had been there for years. Nobody knew where he came from, and nobody knew where he had been. You know, he just got a job from old man Livingston back during the, the war, and nobody knew anything about him and didn't question anything about him. And Seton sort of gave me a one-day lesson in journalism. And he showed me what you had to do to put out a paper, you know, things that you'd have to do. And I sat up there and watched him all day long. And he talked all the time about what he was doing. Then he was gone the next day, and I had to put out the paper. <laughs> and I didn't know until years later when Joe McCarthy 
got to stirring around, you know, in the 50s, and, and, um, and didn't know who Seton was until then. They were having hearings here and there in one place and another. And I picked up the Gazette one morning, and there's Seton's picture, a big spread there, you know. And he had just testified before the Senate committee on whatever it was McCarthy was investigating. He had been the editor of the Daily Worker back in the old days. <laughs> So I was always, after that, able to tell everybody I'd had a one-day course in journalism from the editor of the Daily Worker. <laughs> God, I'm, I'm so glad that story didn't come out in 1957 when, when, when uh, as a lot of us here still remember, Harry Ashmore was a communist, and uh, you remember all that? And, and, and there were God knows how many people in the state of Arkansas who believed that with all their heart. I, there was, uh, I mentioned that there was a fair amount of Tom foolery in the paper and one of the things that uh, would happen, uh, there are occasionally slack periods in the newsroom between editions and, and the copy editors got in a, a period of writing nonsense verse, and, and uh, mo most of them were, were uh, limericks. Some of them quite naughty, I, I understand, but, uh, but all of them funny. And uh, uh, Julia Jones, Drury, she is now, uh, decided it'd be a good idea to collect as many of those things as she could, and she'd take them down off the bulletin board and stuff. And years later, when she was interviewed for this book, she pulled out uh, some of those limericks, and, and, and I want to read you just one of them. It was about a, a fellow copy editor who is not otherwise named except for the name given in this. There once was a lady named Maisie, whose knowledge of style was quite hazy. She used witches for that and ends for ats, and claimed nations were driving her crazy. <laughs> I, I'm going to skip a couple of things that I really want those of you who, who get the book to take the time to read if you don't read anything else. One of them is on page 155, and it's a long, elaborate story about a what was supposed to be an innocuous feature story about Murray's Catfish Diner. How many of you here have been to Murray's Catfish? Oh, good Lord. Well, you, you got to read this. I won't spoil it for you, but you got to read that. You got to read that story. And another one is about the day that Ernie Dumas was changing jobs and leaving the job of, of a reporter to move upstairs to become an editorial writer. And the uh, the city editor, Bill Shelton, came back to his desk holding one of those little scraps of paper that, that he uh, wrote out our assignments on. And usually it would say, uh, do as time allows or something like that. I, I had a bunch of them in my drawer when I left the paper. I don't think he much appreciated it. I hadn't got them done. But this particular scrap of paper was Ernie Dumas's assignment to write Orville Faubus' obituary. Now this was quite a long time before Faubus finally died, but but he, you know, we we, we always like to have these things and and in, in set in type ahead of time in case something happens. And so so uh, Shelton came back and asked Ernie if he had done that that obituary, and Ernie said, "Well, no, <laughs> you know." And I'm, Monday morning I'm going to work upstairs, and and Shelton just said, "Well." If Shelton dies before you finish this obit, the headline is going to read, Faubus dies, Dumas fired. <laughs> and and I'll, let you, I'll let him tell the rest of the story in his own words. It begins on page 162. I don't think he's recovered from that yet. You're still, you're still traumatized by that, aren't you? Yeah. I'm getting up toward the, uh, the dismal years, <clears throat> and I'm going to take, <clears throat> I have four
four paragraphs here that I'm going to read you. It's the, it's the introduction that I wrote on the chapter that deals with the Gannett Company. And the title is Gannett and Be Damned. And it goes like this. The Gannett Company bought the Gazette in 1986 and promised to respect it and maintain its reputation as one of the nation's best newspapers. It did neither. Instead, it systematically set about making the oldest paper west of the Mississippi into an imitation of USA Today with its splashy color, tasteless photos, and page one stories designed to titillate instead of inform. That was Gannett's way of competing with the Arkansas Democrat. The national chain with deep pockets, as its officers put it, set out to bury the smaller rival and turn Little Rock into a one newspaper town. They turned Little Rock into a one newspaper town, but not by burying the opposition. Gannett was not the only corporate villain in the American newspaper business during those years. Dozens of other chains followed the same route, dumbing down their product, as they offensively called their papers, to accommodate the basest tastes of its readers. They paid constant and cloying attention to Wall Street. Stock prices and quarterly profits drove editorial decisions. If anyone in the upper management of one of those newspaper giants thought that informing the citizenry was more important than ever ballooning profits and craven subservience to the stock market, he never let on. A few metropolitan dailies and national newspapers bucked the trend. They included the New York Times, the Washington Post, and at least until Rupert Murdoch, the transplanted Australia media baron bought it, the Wall Street Journal. Overall, though, it began to appear by the end of the 20th century that the golden age of American newspapers had faded. In Little Rock, Gannett's contribution to the general decline is a long, dark, and depressing story. Among the reasons for the failure are the company's arrogance, its hubris, and its stubborn, insistent, breathtaking ignorance about the newspaper it had bought and the state it had served for 167 years. I'm going to skip to the very end of that chapter. It's just a litany of all the bad decisions they made, all the, uh, the numerous examples of what I said in that last paragraph about knowing nothing about the state and caring nothing about the state. But it was summed up in the last sentence of that chapter by Joe Mosby, who spent 20 some odd years on the sports desk and in the outdoors column there. And here's the way Joe put it on the last day when, they, when the employees were leaving the, the uh, Gazette building. One reporter from the Democrats stopped me and asked if he could ask me a few questions. He asked why the Gazette closed. And I told him because Gannett never knew the meaning of the two words at the top of the front page, Arkansas and Gazette. I'm going to wind up with another take on why the Gazette lost the war, and, uh, and then I'll wind it up and we'll think about taking questions if anybody has any. This is from Bob Lancaster, who at various times worked for both the Democrat and the Gazette. Here's what Bob had to say about it. I think there are only one or two facts about the newspaper war that mattered at all. One was that you had, on the one hand, a publisher who was willing to spend any amount of money to destroy any of his holdings and his own bank account and go out and beg on the street if he needed to in order to destroy the other paper. And on the other side, you had a newspaper company that had no sense of its own publication's history. It was not willing to lose money forever just to be able to stay alive. And when you have that kind of ferocity on one side and that kind of indifference on the other side, then it's obvious who's going to win. Could it have turned out any other way? I don't think any improvement at, at any improvements at either paper 
would have made much difference. You got a berserker on one side and a bottom line wuss on the other. Who's going to win? <laughs> Walter Hussman, where are you? <laughs> it's, I might ask you a question. <laughs> now, now, if you feel like coming up here and, and replying to Mr. Lancaster, you're welcome to do so. Uh, we're going to take questions for a few minutes and then there will be a book signing for those of you who are interested in. And let's uh, let's uh, give Roy Reed a round of applause here for us. <laughs> we have microphones, uh, so please uh, wait till the microphone comes to you, but please raise your hand if you have any questions. Good Lord, with all these journalists in the room, I can't imagine. Here's one I... right here in the front row. All right, we're gonna, let's go right back here first, then we'll come up front. I just wondered if you might say a few words, just personal memories of Mr. High School. Uh, how, oh, yeah. How yeah. well he was regarded, how highly he was regarded. What's your name, by the I'm way? I'm Marion Hodges, and I worked in the society section. Oh, you did? When I was in college, I okay. sure did. Okay. Hope to see you outside then, when yeah. the book's on. Mr. High School, oh, God, yes. I. Uh, he was a, well, as, as uh, his son-in-law pointed out, he was the, the son of a Confederate colonel. And, and he, you know, some of his most vivid memories were of things that happened before 1900. I mean, he was a man of 30 when he took over the, the Gazette, he and his brother Fred. And some of the best stories in here have to do with the old man, as we call him, not to his face. Uh, in fact, only, Two people uh, in that Gazette building were allowed to call him uh, anything except Mr. High School or Mr. J.N. Uh, one was in the society section, and uh, uh, Nella Cottenham, who, who called him Ned because uh, she grew up with him, and they went to those dances together and that kind of thing. And the other was an old printer in the back shop who had no reverence for anybody in the newsroom. <laughs> and, and, and he, he was quite a few years older than Mr. High School. And, uh, and his job, by the time, he was, he was getting way up in years, and, and his only job left as a printer was to set editorials in type on the old line of type machines. And, uh, and he would write notes to Mr. High School in the margin in all caps, uh, so they'd be sure to take his notes out from, so they got in print. And he'd write things like, uh, Ned, you don't believe this crap any more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, my favorite story about Mr. High School, and I do preface this in, in the, before I get into the, uh, Margaret Ross is the one who tells it, and I, and I feel obliged to tell the readers that, that I'm not guaranteeing the accuracy of everything in this book because the story is this that that uh, a young a new reporter was hired and they didn't have enough typewriters in the newsroom uh, didn't have one for him so the city editor sent him back to mr high school's office and said mr high school has one in his office go back and get it and the kid went back there and, and mr high school looked baffled he said i don't even use a typewriter right and he did he wrote all of his editorials in Longhand. And the kid went back to the city editor, and, and, and so the two of them went back to Mr. Heisman's office, made a thorough search. <clears throat> and they found two typewriters, and under all the mess, the body of a reporter who had been dead for a year and a half. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm awfully pleased to say that I, I, I knew Mr. Heisman in the way that a very junior underling could know this, this giant. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we got a question right here. Right here in the front, yeah. Well, the older boys are here tonight, and I know most of you. I've seen in world history how the civilizations have died. Mm -hmm. So life is circular. We are now hearing the prophecy that the print news media will die. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching and weighing the paper here in Little Rock to see how close are we to the death of the Democrat? Um, the same thing is going to happen to technology. Do you believe that oral history is going to be the last to die? 
Oh, man, I hope it doesn't come to that, but uh, you, you can't tell. No, I don't really think so. I'm, I'm a lot more sanguine about the future of, of the media in general, and in particular newspapers, my favorite part of it, than, than a lot of the, uh, the, the, well, maybe the people who, who know about what's going on better than I do. I, but I, I think newspapers in particular will go on in one form or another I'm an old person, and I like the feel of that newspaper, that that paper in my hands in the morning. But even if the paper part doesn't survive, we have to have newspapers. We simply don't uh, have any way of getting along without them. And 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 if uh, if God forbid the Democrat Gazette should die, and I, I'm sure it will not, but if it should. Um, something else would spring up. It, in fact, it might take half a dozen something else's to take its place. You know, something covering the heights and something else to cover the state capitol. But we would ha we have to, because we have to have information one way or another. So no, I don't think that, I, I, I'm pretty hopeful about the future. Any other questions? Questions? Any other questions, any other comments? Okay. Yeah, right, yeah, right there, okay. Mr. Reed, I, I happen to have been uh, rereading Walter Lord's history of the siege of the Alamo recently, and it struck me that they, were, they cited the Arkansas Gazette more than any other newspaper in the United States disseminating news of the, of the siege in San Antonio. Um, do, you, you, do you have any other, any other uh, recollections of your research of the, the Extreme history of the Gazette? No, I don't. I'm, I'm interested to hear that. I didn't. I didn't know that. But that's. Uh, I'm not surprised because the Gazette has always been uh, a leader in, in covering affairs far beyond the state of Arkansas. And of course, we did have a, an interest in, in the siege of the Alamo. But a certain number of people who couldn't make it in Arkansas drifted off down to Texas to get employment <laughs> and, and, and stayed. And so I don't. I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for him, I must say, but, but the Gazette did a, you know, it, it, it covered everything going on in Arkansas from 1819 until 1891, with the exception of a certain period of time during the Civil War when there was no way to publish a paper and they had to suspend, but uh, starting right on through Reconstruction, incidentally, somewhere in this book, somebody mentions that the Gazette's history has not always been glorious, not always been on the side of the angels. And one of those periods uh, is covered very well in Griff Stockley's new book, Ruled by Race. And I really recommend that book to all of you. I told him last night that I could only manage to read about three pages at a time before I get so either angry or disgusted at, this, at various parts of our state's history that I have to put it down and, and kind of gather my wits. But he's especially good on the Reconstruction era when the Arkansas Gazette was very much in the forefront of the Democratic establishment trying to get its grip back on the state's politics and government and the lengths that that Democratic establishment went to. And and egged on by the Arkansas Gazette are very tough reading for an old Gazette loyalist. But yeah, I, and thanks for letting me know about the coverage of the Alamo. I'll add that to my... Anything else? Uh, yeah, there. Would you make some comment or tell us a good story about Harry Ashmore? Oh my God. I don't know if I... Think of one that's clean enough to, to tell in mixed company, because he was he was odds oh, down the, the the best storyteller I ever knew, and uh, and I've got a bunch of his stories on tape and in special collections, uh, and the part of the parts of, that I used in here had to be edited. You know, there's a bleep bleep bleep. <laughs> He, he was, he, but he was a very colorful man. He, he, uh, one story that comes to mind, as you, as you know, 
he was easily the most unpopular person in Arkansas in the aftermath of the Central High School crisis because of, of the Gazette's stand uh, toward that and toward Governor Faubus. And he was regularly denounced, um, not just at the Citizens Council meetings, but all over the state. And uh, he, he once told a story to illustrate his plight. And this was at a, as it happened, an enormous outpouring of Gazette sympathizers at the Marion Hotel when the Gazette won two Pulitzer Prizes for its coverage. And Harry got up and started off by telling about, he quoted Lincoln's story about the guy who was being ridden out of town on a rail and tarred and feathered and somebody in the crowd hollered out, how do you like it? And he said, he said, if it wasn't for the honor of the thing, I'd just as soon walk. And, and, <laughs> and Harry likened himself to that poor guy. Uh, but my favorite story about Harry had very little to do with trouble and politics, but, but a more personal thing. He lived on Southwood Road and, and uh, his, his wife, um, what was his wife? Barbara, his wife Barbara, uh, was out in the front yard one day and had a stepladder up against the, the wall cleaning out the gutters and, and the next door neighbor lady came over and I imagine in a tone of considerable indignation and reproof said, Ms. Ashmore, let me ask you, what does Mr. Ashmore do? And she said, he thinks. <laughs> <laughs> but I, lo I loved Ashmore and, and make no apology for it. And, uh, and I think he deserves to be remembered. There was another question over there. After the Democrat became a morning paper and started competing directly with the Gazette, uh, in your interviews, did you get any impression as to whether people underestimated the strength of that competition? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I, I, I told somebody just today that Walter Hussman is the most underestimated genius I've ever known. <laughs> And he's made a damn good living at having people underestimate him. You, but he, uh, he won the thing by just being smarter than they were. And, uh, and I'm not sure I would use the word berserker that Lancaster did, but, but he was also more determined. He went to a lot more trouble to, uh, to find out how to make a newspaper make money. Gannett thought they had all the answers. They didn't need to learn anything new. And he taught them, a first, uh, he taught them some new tricks. And, and I was not a bit, you know, it's not surprising at all, looking back on it, that the Democrat came out on top. One example, he, he uh, and, and he, he tells about this in the book. Uh, he, he came up with the idea of, of giving away classified ads, an insane idea. You know, you don't give away, I mean, that's good, easy money. And, and it's, uh, it's just there like a bird nest on the ground. And, but he said, I'm gonna, and he did. But before he did, he researched the thing very carefully. He went to a couple of places where they had done it in similar uh, situations, competitive, and found out that it worked. And he did it, and it worked. And there were three or four other things similar to that. But yeah, anything else? Got one more question here. Then we're, we're going to have book signing. This is Dennis. Anyone? Roy, if Gannett had not bought the Gazette, would you speculate on what might have happened in the next five or ten years uh, at that particular point? <laughs> well, uh, two newspaper town, for instance. No, it would not. The, the easy, the easy answer, and the one that would get me off the hook, is to quote that snatch of dog rope by, by, by the old colonist in the 20s about the, the spider and the fly, and, and the, the fly is pleading its case to the spider before he, and he says, and I, I can't help but think if that I'd had a, a better line of patter, I might have, you know, might not, and the spider said, well, maybe so, but it would all come out the same in the end. Uh, 
Now, it, it, uh, I did interview, or, or somebody interviewed people at the Gazette and near to the situation who thought that the Gazette actually squandered some opportunities to, to, to win the war. Uh, they talk about the lawsuit that they filed against the, the Democrats won, which turned out badly for the Gazette. And, uh, and maybe not really understanding at the top management level the paper's strength all over Arkansas. It had a clear advantage going into the, the war. As I'm sure Walter Hussman will tell you, and in fact did tell me at some length how every day he woke up, you know, wondering if, if they were going to make it over there. And, and his family, his, you know, his father uh, saying, you know, my God, Walter, we're, you know, we're bleeding money. And, and, uh, and so the cadet had the advantage, but they never figured out how to take advantage of it, they, how, to, how to make it uh, work for uh, the long haul. So I don't really know. I, I don't really know how it might have turned out. But, but no, we would not be a, a two-newspaper town, no matter how, which side won.